Islam is viewed as something like Buddhism, like, okay, it doesn't even exist here. There's not a single mosque. It's not an official religion here, so you can't practice it. Like that you would establish a mosque, it's impossible. It's one of the most Islamophobic countries, I would say, in the world, because mm -hmm. everywhere in Europe, you can at least have a mosque. Here, it's banned. You need okay. 50,000 signatures. It's legally impossible, basically, because right. there's not 50,000 Muslims. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We have Jan, the Slovak Muslim. He is a revert from Slovakia, in case you didn't figure that out from the name. He's also a YouTuber, and he is also an entrepreneur. And he's with us today to talk about his journeys in all of these fields. So without further ado, Jan, welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me here. Tell us a bit about yourself. So as you said, I'm on YouTube beyond the Slovak Muslim, but that's not my main uh, job. It's like a hobby. I run a marketing agency for six years. I reverted to Islam over two and a half years ago. I'm so, sure my audience would be really interested in hearing a bit more about your reversion story. And, you know, how is, how is the impression that you had of Muslims growing up in Slovakia and then, you know, what experiences or, or perhaps people led you to islam oh it's a big question i actually made a video about this on youtube uh, it's like two hours but uh, in a nutshell i was grow grew up as a christian catholic it's like 70 percent of slovaks but i wasn't i mean i was practicing as a child but uh, then i grew up and became an atheist which is like a typical journey of like a European person. And Slovakia is a bit conservative. It's not Western Europe, definitely. But we are not like super Eastern as well. We're somewhere in the middle. But sure. we have been part of the Soviet uh, bloc, post-communist bloc in the in past 30 years ago. So it's been a while. I've never lived through it, but my parents did. So for example, my mom has never left the country and I've been to like 50 countries. So there's a big difference between our generations. And sometimes right. that makes it difficult to relate to one another. Islam is viewed as something like Buddhism, like, okay, <laughs> like it doesn't even exist here. There's not a single mosque. Uh, it's not an official religion here. So you can't practice it like uh, that you would establish a mosque. It's impossible. It's one of the most Islamophobic countries, I would say, in the world, uh, mm -hmm. because everywhere in Europe, you can at least have a mosque here. It's banned. And oh, uh, by law, you can't have one. Yeah, you can't have it. You need okay. 50,000 signatures. It's legally impossible, basically, because right. there's not 50,000 Muslims. It's, it would have to be something unique that would change that. And um, and then, so the ne it's very negative. So, uh, you know, your typical narrative, like uh, Muslims are terrorists, all that stuff. So that's that was my mindset. But I, it was something I wasn't thinking about because it's like, do you think about Jap Japanese religion? No, like like how is that affecting me i have my right. you know like it wasn't it's even, too far away i wasn't really yeah i wasn't religious at all so it wasn't really interesting at all i just knew it existed of course right and that's it pretty much <laughs> so how was your family's reaction when you told them that you were going to revert to islam i researched islam for about three years i think and uh it was a gradual process and i've been uh, like, I knew I will become a Muslim, so I was telling my family already before, uh, like, a few months ahead that this is going to happen. And alhamdulillah, my family is great, so I didn't have a single negative reaction to this day. And they all know I'm a Muslim now. Everywhere we meet, they, they all know what's happening. They might not know exactly what do I believe, but they all know I don't eat this meat, I don't drink alcohol I and see, all this I stuff. See. My wife is Christian, so she's non-Muslim, and uh, she completely kind of how would i say this uh adopted my lifestyle so she also doesn't eat or drink uh, and all these things so we kind of live like uh, this uh, existence um and uh so it's okay i don't have this crazy story that something happened to me uh, it's it. been good so what was the what caused you to revert what was the experience or logic that led you there it's a uh, multiple, you have multiple angles how to look at it. I would say one angle would be rational, rationality or Kalam. You can call it Kalam cosmological argument. This is like a, a school of um, refuse, refuse to acknowledge it. But this was one of the main reasons why I got interested in Islam because I was uh, 
basically involved in philosophy and um i was an atheist so i had to examine my own belief system and i came across a couple of contradictions like such as an infinitely rigorous of events you know such as like everything that begins must have a cause and the cause should be independent blah 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 there's these arguments are quite complex for people to understand they can be like there are many video lectures on it but i usually watch debates on it and it took me some time to to understand that there's basically no other option than to have this infinite chain of events stop at some point even if you have multiverses or string theory or none of these things actually explain the the world but i was always looking for like the explanation behind the reality so so i naturally gravitated then to the concept of tawhid or oneness of allah but some people don't have this mindset so they stop on this path somewhere because you have like uh, like responsibilities or there's a you know when you realize something is true then it has to change your behavior right like there's it's right. not simple like uh, there's consequences of this thing um and how many people like to examine their own belief system it's very unpleasant because you have to start from zero so imagine i delete your islamic knowledge and start from scratch there's no prophet muhammad there's nothing okay right. how does the universe begin <laughs> and here we go so it's very unpleasant most people don't engage there because it makes them uncomfortable they have to change their life then they don't want right. to do it uh 99% of people they don't want to talk about this because yeah it's unpleasant even muslims don't want, don't talk about this so yeah so this is the case you know like how many people are willing to go and change their belief system very little but i had right. to because it was i didn't have a solid world view it was very shaky and i lived very depressed life i would say like my dunya wise life was very dif different to what i live now so um so your belief system will impact the way you live it's just logical so that was my 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 entrance in islam was more like a rational and then i you know it's not enough like islam is not rational only it's there's multi there's multiple layers like your salah is not rational for example or how many ka you do it's not rational it's based on the submission like at some point you have to just submit and that's the goal of islam to just achieve that submission and it's never done because you have <laughs> you can forever just try to follow there's so many things you can follow right so i had to get my head around that it's a very difficult concept for people in the west to grasp that i have to submit to something you know <laughs> like but this is the case yeah yeah that's really interesting and i always thought that islam is is quite a simple religion and it's welcoming to everyone it's very easy for people to enter the religion but as you mentioned it takes effort to to be a practicing muslim right to you know do your prayers pay your zakat fast adjust your behavior and i feel like as you said a lot of people perhaps are scared of being convinced because of what that would require of them in terms of behavior change um mm -hmm. speaking of that what do you think is is i guess unique in your personality or your upbringing that motivated you to actually complete that path and not just stop you know with the uh questions leading to where they were leading uh, why did you decide to to go down that path because it's a really tough path especially someone from Slovakia the society there is not really that friendly to muslims they don't have a good impression of them why even go through that hassle what was the sort of motivation for you to do that i think it's most reverts they come from these environments their motivation is finding truth or some meaning and it doesn't matter if we disappoint our culture or society like the purpose of life is more important than your race your country your language all these things you are born into like i have no choice but just like i was born in this country i the way i look the way i speak but the only choice i really make in my life is to what i really believe right and also islam when it rules over society it classifies people based on the belief system like this is i don't know ahlul kitab this is you know dimis and uh, you have different classifications not based on the race or color but based on like what's your aqeedah what's your belief and that's this is the how we're going to treat 
because it's the only thing you choose like nothing else you choose you can't classify people based on race because it's unfair because you didn't choose the race or your nationality and so for what led me to complete it it was just this pursuit of like trying to understand the world trying to understand the existence i think some people have this i had this from my childhood i had like always this obsession with the universe like even at my school, like uh, very early on, my teacher asked me like, what's your dream to do? And some kids would say to have a car or a house or whatever. And I would say, I want to go to the edge of the universe and see what's at the end of the universe. Like as a young boy, I, I said this as a five year, six year old. Right. And I would always have this in my kind of mind, even though I was pretty jahil in my behavior later on. But this was always some something I tried to figure out. And I thought that there's no answer, of course. I think I thought like it doesn't exist, which made me very depressed. But then I realized, hold on a second, it's not necessarily true. I'm just like very affected by society and whatever I'm reading. But it might be uh, the case that there there is an explanation for this. So I just it it, it took years. I to be honest, I don't really believe in these like quick shahadas or what I see on YouTube because it's not real. Like you cannot accept Islam. Like it doesn't make sense because. For example, just learning how to pray take, took months and there's so many like four madhabs. They all differ. Like how are you going to pick which madhab you follow if there's no madhab in your country? If there's no sheikh, if there's no teacher, you're just going to have a YouTube sheikh. And YouTube sheikh is very, very, very dangerous. This is what leads to many extreme ideas. And this is why, uh, you know, I've built a masjid here in Slovakia now with a couple of guys, reverts. And we are like physically meeting and doing some lectures and alhamdulillah, it's the best thing I've, uh, that ever happened. And, uh, and we're, we know we have this need for a teacher because you cannot understand the Quran and Sunnah. There's no way we don't have the Arabic. We got the interpretations and stuff, but you, you cannot derive fiqh or Sharia or whatever, even the way you pray, you cannot understand it. You have to go to the to what's been out there, like uh, to the thousands of years of history and, you know, the chain of narrations and all this, like it's there for a reason. Like, why are you coming up with your own things if you can just go to the great scholars who have memorized like 400,000 hadiths or something insane like this? Like, you can't compete there. Like, you, It's impossible. Like, just that's somewhere where we are right now but it's three years in the journey in the beginning i just learned through youtube but it's not enough uh, it's good for the beginning of course because you need to practice you can't just wait five years to learn to pray because there's always another opinion how to make do. there's always going to be someone else to show you no this is bida or this is this okay but i need to start <laughs> you know like i don't have time to go through these debates as a revert because i don't even understand what you're saying to me so i just took some basic stuff that i know is like but I, I was mixing it. So I took something from Hanafis, from this, from, you know, I didn't even know these things, but I just needed to make my salah, make my voodoo, pay my zakah. I knew all these things, you know, the the rest, sure. you know, but this is the main challenge. It's easy to get into Islam. It's very difficult to practice uh, right. because uh, there's no Slovak uh, guide. Everything is in English, which is fine for me, but many of our reavers, they don't speak English. So they are kind of, they are kind of actually stuck they just go based on the Quran, and that's very difficult. There's no right. explanation how to pray there. Uh, in detail, so. I, I had no idea there was so few resources in Slovak about Islam. Even English is very horrible because if you Google, right. like if you Google how to pray, you get thousands of websites, all different. They make so much. Okay. Some of them are completely wrong. So it's like yeah. how uh, there's no. I've realized this. I don't know how to solve it. I don't think it's solvable, but there's no nothing to do for reverts. It's never going to happen because no one understands the revert journey because it's such a custom journey. I don't know how to solve it, but maybe in the future. <laughs> you just need no, a community. No, inshallah, it will get solved. We definitely, need, we definitely need sort of a streamlined process for reverts and something that cuts through all the noise that's out there, as you mentioned, and kind of... Yeah. Uh, let's reverts know what they need to know. Sort of going back to, uh, and I, I'm digging here just to figure out, because I'm interested in seeing like what we can do as Muslims to attract uh, non-Muslims to our religion. So I'm interested, was there a particular sort of event that 
started your journey or was it just like a gradual evolution in your logic that kind of led you to Tawheed and the oneness of God? Do you remember anything like it was in gradual, particular? Yeah. Okay. And there were there... some exceptions, but it was more gradual. It took years, as I said. So it's not like yeah. it's some YouTube recommendations, but everything's online. Almost every revert I know, they are all YouTube reverts. None of them actually met a Muslim in their life. Oh, okay. And some of them has been five years Muslim, five years, never met a Muslim. When you became That's... a Muslim, had you met a Muslim before or no? Yeah, because I, I lived in Prague, which is in Czech Republic. It's a different country. And there was a masjid. So I went and I learned to pray there. And I had a community. But it was all Algerians or Egyptians. But I, at least I had some someone to, to, to be with me. But at some point, it's not enough. You need someone who has the same experience. So now we are all Slovak rivers together. But when right. I lived there, I had the masjid. So that was very important. That's like super crucial. But that was the ex exception. Most people, if you are not from the capital or main city... Muslims don't go to villages like, uh, you know, there's a couple of immigrants. They live in the capital, right? So right, right. Uh, if you're in some far, far away place, you're never going to meet a Muslim. Right. And that's a very Islam is a social religion. You cannot do it from your bed in on YouTube forever. You can, but it's not going to there's no benefit. There's it's like you're like such a weirdo <laughs> to everyone, you know. Right. So so I think it'd be. Update. The extensive travel that you did came after you reverted to Islam? Well, I did travel before. I was actually a travel mm -hmm. blogger as well, but I never went to like Islamic countries. Okay. Uh, I did okay. to Turkey, actually, but uh, I didn't like look for Islam. Uh, okay. So I was always traveling uh, a lot, but it wasn't that extensive. I just went to Bosnia for a month in Ramadan, uh, which was amazing because these are Slavic people, so they all look like me and they also speak similar language but they're all muslim which is so insane for me because we are uh -huh. all anti-muslim anti-turkish and turkey right. is like the enemy you know of slavs and turkish they are enemy and europeans always sure. united against turks only right it was right. never right. united against anything right. else Maybe. i actually love turkey i've been to i've been there for a month i've been to antalya istanbul and down in in south and yeah. i love it yeah i'm in turkey right now where are right you now, exactly I'm... I'm on the south coast in a town called Fatih. Have you ever been? Okay. Uh, is it near like Dalmasi or what's the coast? It's near Antalya. Is it Antalya or? Yeah, yeah. It's near Antalya. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I'm actually based out of the United States, but I mm -hmm. wanted to experience Turkey for, you know, while my uh, son was young, I wanted to mm -hmm. experience sort of a Muslim majority country. And uh, yeah, it's great, as you mentioned. But the English is a problem, I've noticed. <laughs> English is a problem, but in Fethiye in particular, because there's a lot of tourism here, you can mm -hmm. get by with with English. Like, okay. people will understand, you know, enough to, to get by, so, which mm -hmm. makes it unique. One of the reasons why I came to Fethiye, actually. So is there any YouTube personality that you think is doing a really good job talking to doing Dawa and especially as it relates to revert someone that perhaps has had a good influence on you? Many of them, but I would classify them in two ways or three. Mm -hmm. One of them would be like professional Dawa groups, mainly from the UK. The other ones would be sheikhs or ulama or like more knowledgeable people, but not really Dawa. It's more Islamic knowledge already. Sure. So in the beginning, I would say it more impact had this Dawa group. But right now, looking back, the sheikhs and the Islamic actually scholars are much more important, like without a shadow of a doubt, because even if you embrace Islam and you can't even make wudu and you make you can't even make a valid prayer, like there's there's so many people who leave Islam after shahadas because they, right. there's nothing to do. So these people of knowledge are really important. So I would say. Huge impact had people on YouTube, but they were more like these, like Dawa internally. What were some of their Muslims. names? I would watch like people want to check them out. Yeah, I mean, there's some of them. You know, I know one guy. This, this is not a sheikh, Mohammed Hoblos. You know, he's more like he had like huge lectures. He's from Australia, but he was talking to Muslims. But I would already listen to it like I'm a Muslim, but I wasn't. But uh, it was very, very very good for me because he's very passionate and uh, i enjoyed it you know and he doesn't kind of shy, shy away from the dean and uh, he doesn't really get into this whole like 
Madha, what are you? What's your Akita? You know, all yeah. this stuff, which is like a toxic debate. He, he's cool, but it's more like a gangster, <laughs> gangster that one. Not like a, <laughs> it's more like very okay. informal, you know. And right. there are many, many chefs I watched, but I've realized over time, and this is the case in business as well. If you go on YouTube channels and business YouTube channels, the most popular business people or people who the most popular chefs or Islamic scholars actually have the least amount of knowledge. The most amount of knowledge have the least popular people. So maybe a chef with 30 subscribers on YouTube have much more important things to say, but he just doesn't know how to say it properly. But the things right. he's saying, it's like groundbreaking. And the guy who has like millions views, he's just like superficial. He doesn't really say much. He's like, you know, he has a charisma maybe, but yeah. it's not really the, the knowledge there. So there's a balance between being, I would say my skill is the first, the dawa, like being able to communicate. I'm not the type of person who would go it's, seek It's the same with knowledge. Islamic finance, trust me. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And it's the same with everything, even in my space, whoever had the most popular, uh, like, uh, space on YouTube would be like giving very generic advice, like yeah. super generic, like beginner level. And then the guys who had like 500 subscribers, they would go so in depth, they would show every yeah. process and 10 people would watch it. And I was like, why are people doing this? This is the case. This is every, every segment is like this. So at yeah. some point you have to remove yourself from these uh, professional dawa people because they are actually not really professional. Uh, some of their fatawas or some of their approach, it's not really correct. Like even they make huge mistakes and you have to go to the real scholars at some point. I'm still right. not there, by the way, but I'm just saying that you can't just stay on YouTube watching these dawa guys forever because yeah. it's not, it's, it's just beginner level. This is nothing like, you right. know. Makes sense. What do you think is one of the sort of most underserved aspects of Dawa? That is like something that reverts need to know about or non-Muslims need to know about, but it's very seldom talked about and, and needs to be talked about more. Is there any oh, do you mean for reverts or for people who are non-Muslim? Because that would be different. Uh, let's do each one. Let's do each one. What's something for um, reverts for... that's underserved? And then let's talk about non-Muslims. Well, for reverts, I think uh, I'm actually uh, dropping a video today on this topic, but it's still relevant. Navigating yourself within Sunni Islam is a nightmare uh, for a revert. Mm. So mm. someone has to break it down. What's Salaf? What's Iman Maliki? What's this? What's Shafi? What's... I see. Why is this so sex? Why? What's the Akida? Who's Ibn Taymiyyah? Someone has to, but this is a problem. You always have a bias. So whoever's going to explain this will give you their bias. I right. realized this, that it's impossible task because even under the comments, under the video, they are actually fighting people. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. okay, so we just proved it's impossible to answer this because the right. scholars themselves are in uh, conflict. But uh, as a revert, this is so problematic because... For example, let's say I know 50 reverts here in Slovakia and they all yeah. pray differently. We all view Islam differently. Some of them completely reject the Sunnah. Some of them go Salafia. Completely Some reject the Sunnah, the meaning they just follow the Quran or like... Just the Quran, they say Sunnah okay. is made up. So because right. there's no knowledge, so like someone has to give the basics. Right, uh, right, right. I don't know how to do it. And I think the best way to do it is in person. The best way to have it is having some, not mufti, but someone in the country who can actually not create a madhab, but create a way of thinking. We don't have it here. We just have a couple of places of, uh, like, we can have a prayer room. This is what we have. And there's some people, I'm doing jumas. You know, I'm a river. I'm doing jumas. Like, this is insane, right? right? <laughs> I've learned how to do it. Like, uh, so it's valid, yeah, but it's fine. still, uh, like, I shouldn't be doing this, right? So. There needs to be someone, I would say Islamic countries or Islamic people of knowledge. I'm not talking to regular Muslims. I don't want to talk about them because every Muslim has stupid ideas. Like they don't even know what they're talking about. Uh, mostly like regular Muslims. Like I wouldn't listen yeah. to them at all because these are just uh, cultural Muslims usually, or they bring in mm -hmm. some weird things with them. But mm -hmm. if you have someone who's a student of knowledge, they should be more concerned. Like let's say, I, I made so many videos. We need help. We need help. We don't need money. We have money. 
We need right. help. We need knowledge. Someone, not a sheikh, he's not, there's no place for a sheikh here, but someone who's an official student of knowledge, whatever, he should come here. He should uh, help us, you know. Uh, there's, this is like physically someone has to come to these places because otherwise we're just lost. And the Islam, like my kids will grow up without Islam then. You know, right. how can I retain it? So we need that. We need that. This I know many a, people fund This is an important masjids. point. Yeah. I, yeah. I hope yeah. And there's so many students listening. of knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. There's I, thousands I, of them. I hope someone who's listening maybe takes you up on that offer. <laughs> Uh, because they need to get uh, some job as well you know we're, we're yeah. not an official organization we are registered by the government now we're in the process uh, but it's still like an ngo and uh, you know we don't really need like an official official islamic school or whatever because you can have it informal like you can have quranic classes or you can learn arabic whatever it's fine to do it like informally but at least we have to have this place and the only place i know in europe that was able to achieve this is spain granada Spain Granada Masjid is beautiful. It's in the middle of the city and it's built by reverts. It's run by reverts. It's a Maliki Madhab. But the guy who came there was like a British revert who established everything. And now it's served by thousands of people. The reverts had their kids and the kids had the kids. And it's it's been there since the 80s, I think. And first there were some protests, but then, then they saw how the masjid helped the city. And now it's like one of the tourist attractions. And it's like a new masjid, like 30 years ago, maybe they built it. I don't know. But that's the model I am I think we we should aim at. And it's not the Andalusia Muslims. It has no history. These were all new reverts. Reverse. There's not, Because the Muslims were there 500 years ago. They were all wiped out. There, there was no Muslims in Spain left. They right. just had this like, this masjid was brand new. And so I think that's, yeah. That's something we, that's the only thing I know because the other, they're like in the UK, there's 4,000 masjids, but they're all run by Pakistanis or Indians or whoever. That's not a model that can work because right. it's not a revert model. It's, it's It has to be someone local, but we need external help. We need someone who will be able to kind of give us some guidance. I think that's the best uh, model for reverts. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my advice. <laughs> Or what we need. Makes sense. Yeah, and I hope someone who's listening heeds this call. What about for <laughs> non-Muslims, an aspect of Dawah that is perhaps neglected? Such a huge question. I don't know for non-Muslims. Uh, basically, the from a mo- non-Muslim to Muslim, besides that Allah guides, of course, we all know this, but besides this, for someone not to hate Islam, at least, you have to remove misconceptions. So essentially, it's all about the knowledge or just having the knowledge. And I saw it on my uncle. He's actually my godfather. And he asked me, like, am I still your godfather if you're Muslim now? Because I, you were baptized. I was your like, godfather. I'm like, yeah, you can be my godfather. But uh, I, gave him a, uh, I gave him a pamphlet. And it was, like, very small. It just explained basic things. But every page was like this, terrorism and Islam. And then four wives and Islam, all the controversial. Like, you have to right, go through right. these. And right, it just, right. and it was like 20 pages and he read it and I've met him like last week and he said like, such a great book, like, what should I read next? Like, should I read the Quran? And I'm like, yeah, you can, but maybe you can, you need something else. And then I, I was hearing him argue for a Muslim point of view against uh, some of the other uncles. He was like, oh, Muslims believe in Jesus, Muslims. And he already knew the basics, so he could yeah. like say it and they were like, but you're not a Muslim. So why are you saying these nice things? Because he already knows this is the truth. Uh, like in terms of uh, at least the bias has been removed. So he at least knows what Islam means, you know. Um, right. And I think that's just going through. Because you can do, I would say, a nice dawah, which is like, okay, Islam means peace. Islam is great, blah, blah, blah. Islam can work right, anywhere. Right, right. We right. can. This is nice. but then you have the reality and the islamic history and it's not true that islam means peace and it's not true that you know there is sharia there are these things in islam which you have to explain you can't just hide them and if you keep right. hiding this it's going to be perceived as like this guy is hiding something so you, you have, have to, to be proud and say head on yeah. yeah i would say like you have to position islam as alternative to the system like hey we right. now live here but let's look at the history it wasn't like this before the nation state didn't exist since 1648 before that, you had the Age of Empires. So there was no like uh, human rights. There was no 
national nationalism minorities there was just kingdoms and empires and all that the completely way of different way of life and you have to educate and also show that islam is kind of superior in all these systems because it is so it's just, it's a hard yeah. job yeah. it's a good answer Jan. and uh, definitely it is a hard job but one that i think is you know there's no greater reward than being able to change someone's afterlife right uh with uh through dawah well through that's the thing uh, you know i i i have a slovak youtube as well and it's like very small it has like 500 subscribers and i do some topics i don't talk about deep islamic issues because i'm not a scholar but sometimes yeah. i say something about what would islam say about this or whatever and you know some people watch it some people hate it of course and but since we established this local masjid let's call it this way I had many people like email me sometimes and we had these two guys travel from a different side of the country first time they met us before like three weeks ago we explained to them the islam we prayed together then next time they came they took shahada so i was the one doing the shahada for of two guys it was amazing i've never done it before and i i thought like i'm some sort of sheikh because i always watch it on youtube you know and i was like ashadu anla and it was like so amazing <laughs> And these guys, and the guy said to me, he had the dream with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam before, like a couple of days before, that he's in this masjid accepting Islam. Awesome. And you know, there's a hadith. If you see the Prophet in the dream, it's like right. the Prophet. Right. Uh, so it's, and he was scared to share it. I'm like, no, this is hadith. This is reality. Like we believe in dreams. Like you can't have these things. And it was so amazing. And so, and there's always someone new. And sometimes it feels like, why am I doing this? So many people, like not many people do view it or whatever because my english channel is much bigger and this masjid we're just like 20 guys like overall and it has an impact because yeah as you said like his afterlife may be changed so imagine this is like huge reward and yeah. like if allah, allah says in the also that you shouldn't look at the like you should do continuous deeds you don't look at the impact just your intention is important so even if one person accepts islam after 10 years of dawah it's better then you know if maybe million so don't look at these numbers because it's a back it's a it's a different game you're playing with this so i think it's it's great yeah doing this yeah alhamdulillah and is that um a part of your motivation to make the youtube channel uh yeah the slovak muslim or what was your motivation behind starting that channel well i had this channel like years before so it started as non-muslim it was called okay. debating truth so I was speaking about different topics, not just Islam. And then I converted, so I changed the name. So I always had the YouTube. I had many YouTube channels. I had like three or four, mm -hmm. uh, a couple of them with like thousand subscribers, some some others, some was business. And yeah, so this was just like me talking about whatever I found interesting. And I had this one video about Mike Tyson that like did 700,000 views. And I was like, uh, okay, I'm going to just continue doing this. And so it there it was like a gradual process. It's been like three years, and I just make videos on the topics I like. So yeah, nice. it's not so like it's a not professional necessarily um, Islam uh, that you talk about, but you talk about other things as well. I talk about anything, but the mostly yeah. from Islamic point of view. So I would say ninety five percent is about Islam, but not like. Is your audience is your audience Muslims or are your audience, yeah hundred uh, percent people? Okay. okay. Yeah, I all Muslim, it, all it, it, from yeah. US mostly in UK. Nice, cool. Now tell me a bit about your sort of the professional side of your life because I know that you're an mm -hmm. entrepreneur. Tell me a bit about your journey there. So I have a, a company called InSales Academy. It's a B2B marketing agency <laughs> and it's been yeah. like since 2017. Mm -hmm. So that's like six years. And this business is set up in the beginning. I didn't know what I was doing at all. I set it up like shortly after I left my full-time job as a salesperson. I would say it's a merger between appointment setting slash outreach, personalized outreach slash some marketing stuff. More important thing was like after some time, I realized you need to decide what kind of business you want to create because you will be trapped by it. You'll be like a slave, <laughs> entrepreneur slave. It's a really like I saw it many times and yeah. I didn't want to do it. So there's always a choice. Either I grow this business and scale it, but what would it take? And some business model is unscalable. There are business models like this, especially in agency world and service-based businesses. 
can only yeah. scale if you add more people which add more to your bottom line so it's like a horrible business model and there are some right. companies do it but i don't want to be running a hundred person company that makes the same amount of money as like a five person agency because the expenses are just through the roof so it's like uh, why would i create this like it doesn't make sense right. so i just said like okay this company i have it will just be purely for me it will be just be like a, a small agency for my life because business is in my life it's not like you look at it, your life as a, like you have your health you know different aspects of your life religion stuff and business is one of them but i used to be super focused on business and i would neglect everything i was overweight no religion nothing i wouldn't go out and that's not healthy that's like horrible <laughs> and now right. i pay much less attention to my business but it's doing better because i've decided i will just set it up as a like lifestyle business so it will support my life as a founder i will not pay myself like i will not scale it i will not i know exactly how many clients do i have before it becomes a problem and this is where we need to keep it and it's just like that and there's a reason for it because i need we don't have for example i can't have a mortgage i can't right. have there's no islamic bank in reality there's only two options i can rent forever or i can make a lot of money but if I scale a company, there's no profit. How can I take it out after 10 years? Like, so my my thing is I'm doing a huge profit margin, 30, 40, 45% with a small business model. And I'm taking it out all by myself. I'm not reinvesting. And because I want to buy a house and then inshallah, just a couple of months from now, it should reach the target where I can buy it with cash and be inshallah. without riba and that's it well, that's so great. there's a that's reason really for inspiring it. actually how I, how old did you say you were i'm 32 okay, i just turned 32 good. that's good mashallah and you're gonna buy a house in cash that's great i think this inshallah. will be really inspiring <laughs> for other other viewers i think in the future for example if uh, some billionaire decided to set up, set up a real estate fund not actually a bank but a hundred million dollar real estate fund for European most people that's not regulated as a bank because it's like a loan whatever or it, it has a different entity that would be possible then to have it that they would purchase the the house on your behalf and you would repay them back yeah, yeah. I did hear uh something interesting from you which was the your approach to business was uh essentially to build a lifestyle business that's like the base business and i think when right. you start out it's the easiest to do is the service-based business model it's good to yeah, start not... with maybe a service business or it's good to start exactly. working for someone else and, exactly and learn from that and and sort of develop the complexity of your um business and your offerings sort of as you gain experience i would say yeah you need to work with, yeah. with someone who's who's done it before and you need to just help them and if you want to do your own thing then service based. yeah i actually want to launch a course it's not like a fake course like not like whatever but a, a real one where it's just walking people through how you can transition the freelancing into like an agency model so that you can start kind of scaling it and it's not depending on you, but you can kind of cap it at some point and create this sort of business model, uh, whether it's a design agency, software agency, fixed time projects, time and material projects, doesn't matter. Agency models are the same because they depend on people. So if you have this, if you want to transition from freelancing, I'm preparing this kind of course, but I don't know if I will have time to launch it. Very cool. So what would you, what message would you like to share with other Muslims about first doing da'wah and then second, as it relates to becoming entrepreneurs, if you want to kind of put a bow on this conversation? Mm, maybe the, I'll start with the second part. So there's a path to do it, to be an entrepreneur. There's no problem. But the problem is you, usually. And many people will fall off because it's just difficult. But it's not impossible. So, for example, I started as a cold caller. I did like 100,000 cold calls as my sales job before. So I removed this barrier of like someone re rejecting me. I It's fine because they all rejected me. So I had already my ego crushed. And that's the baseline. That's where you start. You have to get rejected so many times that it doesn't bother you anymore. And then when I started my company and I went to meet CEOs or in big offices or just meeting, 
it wasn't that like I wasn't that scared or it wasn't strange and I was like very young 25 26 you know it's like and the more you meet like after 100 meetings you'll get this like now if I meet with someone I don't even prepare like I don't I can just walk in and just talk and so it all comes with experience but if you want to start something you need to get this experience somehow so you can either get it on your own mistakes or you can learn it from somebody else uh, there's no like one path or one uh, device I can give you because everybody has a different skill. So maybe if you know how to program, you can launch an extension on Google Chrome that gets thousands of downloads. Somebody purchases it and hey, bam, you made your exit. Great. Like there's so many ways. Or if you don't know how to program and you're more like a creative, you start your freelancing. After some time, you hire guys in on Upwork from different countries. So you make your profit. You need to like vet them to and sort of learn the outsourcing, how that works. And then you can you can become a business owner. I haven't seen a single startup that's successful that is not run by a founder who has at least 10 years of experience. So yeah, <laughs> look at the lowest hanging fruit that you have yeah, based exactly. on your skill set and start there uh, before you start reading. Exactly. So uh, that's as it relates to uh, entrepreneurship, anything as it relates to DAWA and how Muslims mm -hmm. can perhaps uh, increase the odds of, of giving out uh, effective DAWA. Oh, man, I don't know. Maybe just start with your environment. So if you have some colleagues, but don't talk to them about Islam because that never kind of works. Just it's more about your adab or your behavior. Or right. if there's a topic, Setting usually an there's example. a well, there's a conversation starter. Usually, it's very easy. For example, there's a dinner and you don't eat uh, meat, and they say right. you're a vegetarian. Right. This always happens, and I say I'm not a vegetarian. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Yeah. Well, I'm a Muslim. We don't eat this. Why? And you explain the halal concept. Oh, okay. And then that's kind of how you can start it without forcing it because it's interesting or or you can pray somewhere, they can see you, whatever. Like there's so many ways in Islam you can, or mortgage, just talking about the house. Many people talk about the investments right, and right. you say, hey, I'm, I'm now building a house, but I, I can't take a mortgage. So I just want to buy it. And they are like, well, you don't take a mortgage. Why? Well, it's forbidden for Muslims, you know. Oh, really? The government forbids Muslims? No, no, no. I'm saying it's <laughs> religiously not allowed. What do you mean? Well, right. if you look at the interest, it creates fake economy and these bubbles and blah, blah. And you can then explain this one concept of Islam and it may create interest to look into Islam. Then like hmm, that interest. Okay. Interesting. Because it makes sense. <laughs> so so then right. they look into it. So there's always but options. Don't to, try to, to debate, force but I wouldn't, to try and Yeah, I wouldn't say like... It. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't say like, hey, let me tell you about Islam. There are some people <laughs> who do it here, yeah. uh, some Pakistani guys here, and it never works because yeah. people don't... I see you're it. in a hurry trying to get into this taxi, but before you get in, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, pick, uh, pick, your, pick your spots, basically. Makes sense. So where can people find you, Jan? Well, you can just go to my YouTube, Beyond the Slog Muslim, and you'll find me. And if I ever drop any course or something, I'll, I'll post it there. Perfect. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and sharing your experiences. I'm sure many viewers found it insightful, compelling, useful. So thank you for lending your time. Yeah, thank you, Rakan. Jazakallah khair.